taller than you? Is this a good height? This is okay. Hello. Okay. Hello. Welcome back after the break. If everybody could please take a seat, that'd be wonderful. Okay. Um, I wanted to just make a, an announcement for those who weren't aware that some of the um, the treats from the from the tea break were from Azerbaijan, from the student uh, network. Wait, no, the Azerbaijan student network, as well as from our organizer uh, Vusala, who brought some back in her suitcase from Azerbaijan. So. Yes, so thank you for that. And that's part of the theme because we actually have a performance after these two lectures um, from uh, an artist from Azerbaijan who will be performing something that's actually on in the Intangible Heritage um, UNESCO list from Azerbaijan. So um, that's just a side note. So um, I would like to welcome our next speaker to the stage. I'm very excited that she was able to make it, uh, Daisy Sutcliffe, who um, will be speaking about Jurassic Coast, which is a World Heritage Site in England, and um, she was recommended to us by Tim Badman, um, who is on our, uh, our advisory board, or one of our committees, and um, she, uh, yeah, so she came highly recommended, and she's doing really exciting work um, integrating arts within uh, World Heritage Sites, so um, I think we're all very excited to hear what she has to say, so please welcome her to the stage. Thank you. So, hi, so no pressure then. Um, <laughs> hi everybody, so I'm Daisy Sutcliffe, I'm currently studying for a PhD in geography um, following the last five years where I've been working on the Jurassic Coast World Heritage Site, first of all as their arts coordinator and going on, oh you want me to talk more into, can you hear me? It's more for the live stream than Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> Okay. Okay? Okay. I'm not used to having microphones in my face. Um, so yeah, I was working on the Jurassic Coast World Heritage Site for five years and that's what I'm going to talk about today and I'm possibly going to say some things that are a bit ignorant because I haven't done very much academic reading for a long time. My undergraduate was 20 years ago um, in social anthropology, so I'm carrying on in the same vein, but I've, I'm, I have a lot of academic reading to catch up on. So I'm just going to run through what we did on the Jurassic Coast. This is about um, how you actually do things, how you make things happen, rather than the idea. I mean, it's obviously about the ideas behind them, but when you come to do things in reality, there's a lot of negotiating to be done, as we've heard from many of our other speakers. Um, and finally, I'd like to say thank you to Innovate Heritage for making it possible for me to be here and to all the other speakers who I've heard from who have been really, really inspiring. So, you still have a book look, that looks like this in your packs. Um, this was the final report that we wrote at the end of the project. It's aimed at managers of naturally designated sites, so the language might be a bit weird to you, but bear with me on that. So, a little activity to start us off with. Um, I want you to get into small groups and rank these items in order of value. Um, highest first, please. So, one minute for that. <laughs> Go. <laughs> So can you see them? We've got art, nature, science, family, my dog, and my old car. Okay, have we got another microphone that we can use? No, sorry, I didn't brief you about that. Yes, but it's in front of the speakers. <laughs>
Yes, okay. we do. So I'm just going to rove around and ask you which one you, ones you ranked highest and why. And we haven't got very long, so I won't, won't spend hours. Brilliant. Brilliant. Okay. So, who shall I pick on first? Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> Rosanna. <laughs> what did you get to? Nature, family, art, science, car, dog. And why? Good question. <laughs> Nature is very important. Yeah, well, nature is, I just love to be in there. Family, because I probably have to say so, they'll kill me. Um, art, because I'm an artist. Um, science, because it's useful sometimes. In the, <laughs> in the car, so you can get there. And, and the dogs last, because I just, I've never been a dog owner. Thank you. That's as right as the answer is going to be, I think. Anybody else have any di anything different? Nature is science. Nature is science. Thank you. Anybody else? Anything to say? Car was the bottom. Okay. Any reason for that? They're a bad thing. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'm going to stop there. It's just a little exercise to get everybody thinking about value, which is what heritage is all about, I guess. I'll give you back the microphone. And also, we've been sitting and listening to things for a long time, so it's nice to do something a little bit more active. So, uh, where is the Jurassic Coast? The official name for the Jurassic Coast is the Dorset and East Devon Coast World Heritage Site. And um, we gave it a shorter name. Um, the Steven Spielberg film Jurassic Park came out while we were going through the designation process and it seemed like a natural match to get a bit of extra publicity. So um, that's where it is in England, if you saw the slide before. It's 95 miles long, it runs from the back of the cliffs to the low mean watermark and it excludes all the um, built up areas that there are along the coast. There's about 150,000 people living in 10 communities along the coast. So, what's it all about? Um, Jurassic Coast, okay, we'll start with the Earth. The Earth is 4.6 billion years old, so we're told by the scientists. They are useful sometimes. Um, complex animals only involved about 600 million years ago. And the Jurassic Coast tells the story of about a third of um, the life on the Earth, so about 185 million years of the Earth's history which puts me in my place regularly. Um, how did it form and how did the story form? Um, so the rocks, it was, it's all sedimentary rocks. They were laid down in a gently subsiding basin with the Triassic, the oldest rocks at the bottom, the Jurassic in the middle and the Lower Cretaceous at the top. There was then a huge event in geological terms which tipped the west upwards and the east downwards and then the coast, the surface eroded and you can see that we're beginning to see why it's a walk through time. Um, more Cretaceous rock settled on top of that because this is an ongoing process con continuing um, and renewed erosion created the landscape that we have today. So a walk from the west to the east is a walk through 185 million years of the Earth's history and that's why it's a world heritage site. Uh, rocks, fossils and landforms. So when I came into my job I was told in no uncertain terms that we were a natural world heritage site and that was a very different thing to a cultural world heritage site and that's been with me ever since I started that and I still question whether that's a useful way of looking at heritage um, and open for conversations about that afterwards. Um, so the guiding principle from UNESCO is that UNESCO encourages world heritage sites to be managed through partnerships, believing that this helps them to become part of the fabric of the communities in which they're sited. Um, and the Jurassic Coast is managed by the Jurassic Coast Partnership, which is a non-constituted group of stakeholders who are responsible for writing, monitoring and reviewing the management plan. The management plan is the contract that the government has with UNESCO for maintaining the site. 
Partnership involves people from various sectors, including tourism, science, education, transport, community representatives and museums. There are about 35 people at most steering group meetings, which is a lot of people to talk to and communicate with, and listen to, more importantly. Um, and the arts programme came about because we wanted to enhance work around engagement and understanding. So we widened the group, the, the steering group, to include people working in the arts, mainly strategically to start with, and now we occasionally have artists. Um, I don't know whether you can see this, probably not, the writing's tiny, but this is basically how it all came about. So in, the, the coast was designated in 2001 as a World Heritage Site. 2003, there was an interpretation plan written um, in partnership with the Natural History Museum in London. And that led to the development of the Creative Coast Group because the arts was mentioned in that as a way of interpreting the site. So in 2006, um, some consultants were appointed who developed and published an art strategy. And that was the same year that the London 2012 Olympics was announced. The art strategy came first, I have to say. Um, but there, it became obvious that there was an opportunity for funding a much larger scale arts programme than was originally intended. Um, so two different consultants were appointed to get the money in place from 2007 to 2008, working across all 10 communities with as many of the 150,000 people as they could to work out what we should be doing and get some money. Um, and in 2008, I was appointed as the coordinator to deliver and develop the arts program. Um, that finished in 2011, the Olympics were in 2012, so there was a bit of a gap, um, and we got some follow-on money to st develop the strategic side of the work so that we embedded it more thoroughly in the practices of the local organisations. It was clear that there were lots of organisations on the Jurassic Coast doing amazingly good work, so it wasn't necessary to add another organisation to that, and what we wanted to do was to enable the organisations that were already there to engage with the World Heritage Site and use that to raise money. Um, the key things that I learnt while I was doing the project, which was a huge project, so most importantly is to be really clear about what you're doing and why you want to do it. Um, they're all kind of obvious things and they apply to almost anything you do in life, but it's useful to go back to them every now and again. Um, my second observation would be that I'd start really small, I'd develop the partnerships and the relationships that you need to develop the work before you start trying to develop the work, because if you don't, you'll have opposition and it becomes much, much more difficult to do. And, if, you know, you only want to do stuff that people want to be there, so, yeah. Um, the third thing is to communicate, which I probably found the hardest thing of all. When you're communicating with lots of different people from lots of backgrounds, you need to use lots of different languages, even within English. Um, and you need to be able to communicate to people what they're going to get out of something, um, which isn't always easy. And it's not always obvious what they're going to get out, especially when you're working with the arts, because you never quite know what they're going to be before they happen. So. That was an ongoing process. And the final thing that we learned was that the arts do and can support management of a naturally designated site. Um, and that was really important. So we did 34 arts projects over five years. Uh, they were seen by more than 200,000 people. We had 5,000 participants and volunteers. Uh, as I said, I didn't organize the arts projects. I just tried to coordinate them and bring them together under one umbrella. Um, as far as we know, we're the only natural world heritage site in the world that builds the art sector into the management plan. Um, there's lots of uh, heritage organisations, mainly cultural heritage organisations, that work really effectively with artists. Um, but there's not very many naturally designated organisations. And the language barrier is more different, difficult, I think, there. So why did we do it? Um, artists create... This is a quote that I got from Richard Crow, who I was working with, who wrote a publication called Arts in the Protected Landscape for the Arts Council, and I, this I find really useful. So artists create both physical landmarks that help us identify where we are, and I, I think equally importantly, if not more importantly, emotional landmarks. Stories, films, plays, and songs that help us to define and explore our relationship with the landscape. Um, why arts on the Jurassic Coast again? So the 
Outstanding universal value, which is a UNESCO term of the site, which is the rocks, fossils and landforms, was an integral part of the area's culture before designation. Obviously, they'd been there for, for a lot longer than the designation had been, and it was important to acknowledge that. Um, so what we tried to do was to build on that heritage, exploring world heritage values, the outstanding universal value of the site, and what that means to people. It provided opportunities for arts and creative thinking to be more widely integrated into the education, interpretation, conservation and awareness programs within the management plan. I'll come back to that. Uh, another quote that I liked from a lady called Sharnid, who I've done some work with, um, who says, because it was an arts and science program, scientists may be able to explain how the brain works in terms of mapping the cortex or understanding synaptic connection making or the function of neurotransmitters but they find it hard to convey how experience feels the way it does to us as individuals. And I think that is where, for me, that's where the arts comes in. So, I'm gonna do a short film just to show you one of the 34 projects. So, if the technology's on my side, that should work. Ah, no sound. Anne, where are you? There's no sound. Sorry, people. <laughs> what I can do is skip that and come back to it, actually, because I've got some other slides of some of the other projects. That was just the biggest one, and the one which we've got a, a nice film for. Try it again. Okay. She did test it before we started and it worked then. Oh. Yeah, that's right. Great, okay. The Jurassic Coast Earth Festival is a one-year festival to coincide with the Olympics. The world's eyes for a couple of weeks, uh, and perhaps broader, are going to be on Dorset as well as London. Many people are totally unaware that we have what is effectively our version of the Grand Canyon. It's on our doorstep and it needs to be exposed to people. Good evening everybody, welcome to Etude. Etude is the Jurassic Coast Earth Festival's only international performance. As many of you will know, the Jurassic Coast tells the story of 185 million years of the Earth's history. The Coast Earth Festival is a lens that enables you to travel 180 million years into the Earth's history to understand about contemporary natural sciences. So it's about understanding about climate change, it's about understanding about extinction, it's an understanding of the need to conserve the natural environment. Let's disembark the aircraft this way. Okay, so We've not done anything like this before. Unique. <laughs> yeah, it is unique. Very enjoyable. Complete surprise. So lots and lots and lots of different things, cultural, artistic and natural heritage, go to make up this enormous celebration along the Jurassic Coast. It's amazing. Why is it amazing? It's just how it works and everything like that. Yay! Yay! The invited guests are asked to take their seats in the Marine Theatre for the launch party of the 2012 Fossil Festival. The annual Lime Regis Fossil Festival that's been going on for some years has evolved into something larger. Today's the big day. Today's the kickoff for the Jurassic Coast Earth Festival. There's events happening in Exmouth, there's events happening in Swanage, 
Weymouth, Lowermouth, wherever. There is something happening as part of the Earth Festival brochure, which is absolutely fantastic. Oh. UNESCO have this phrase about World Heritage to make it a function in the life of the community. And I think the Fossil Festival very much exemplifies that. It's a community event in Lyme Regis, although it gets people in from all over the country. It's something which is a positive thing for Lyme Regis, and it's happened because of the World Heritage Site. I've learned that um, there were over a million um, dinosaurs um, around about three million years ago. I would like them to take away uh, an interest in fossils and evolution and the natural sciences. I just want them to be inspired to want to know more about a whole range of things that the World Heritage Coast has to offer. Well, the benefit has been that we're part of a much bigger thing. It's just wonderful to be part of a team. It's amazing. Why is it amazing? It's just how it works and everything like that. The Pliosaur brings to the Earth Festival, I think, probably the real children's fascination in dinosaurs and all things Jurassic, and engaged parents in those things through the children, really. Did you think it was scary in there? Um, no, I thought it was really exciting. I think that children, if they can touch things and, and actually be involved with it, it makes it a lot more of an interesting experience. <laughs> It was basically quite disgusting, really. Why? Uh, well, because it ate quite a lot of things and he didn't really, you know, clean up. Daddy! Can we do that? Okay. Do, you want to, do you want to finish the bit you were doing first and then we'll flip it over and uh, we'll be able to see the other side of it better then? Right? Yeah. So is that the idea? I've been booked to come here to work on this Earth Festival project. Uh, building these enormous local insects. Right, any little gaps you can see, see like these little bits, just try and fill them in. Well the Earth Festival of course is made up of lots and lots of different kinds of events. This would fit into the natural environment category, so this is a celebration of the natural environment local to West Bay and to Bridport, and that includes the Jurassic Coast, but also the wildlife and history as well. It's really nice having an event down in West Bay because you get all the local children as well as the people that are visiting and they're staying in the local campsites. We're camping in Fleet. Yep. And we come from Woking. Woking in Surrey. We haven't got any paint on holiday with us and we don't normally do it at home. I hope we stay here all day. Would you like to come through now, please? And if I may see your boarding cards. Thank you, and welcome to Jurassic Airlines. First of all, we take you through normal procedures, such as check-in. We then take you through security with our 3D Humili scanner. Um, again, with messages about the Jurassic Coast and the environment. As part of the Earth Festival, on board is a fusion of many different disciplines in art, science, geology, it's multi-layered. It sort of reflects the, the, the nature of the Jurassic Coast, which is all made up of layers. I learned fossil fuels came from the Cretaceous period. You've got to come and experience it for yourself. I don't think, because it's so unique, I don't think there's anything out there to compare it with. The Jurassic Coast offers us a huge resource in terms of medicine. The idea was to find a collection of people first who would in some way manufacture, but not necessarily literally, artefacts that could be shipped across to another World Heritage Site. Great, yeah. 26 or 27? Are you sure it's 27? When Sim and Sally found me, I didn't actually know how many bones there were in the feet, which was a little bit embarrassing. <laughs> and I had to count them up. We happened upon this musical box. We converted everybody's timelines into minutes, which was the smallest time frame. And then we um, applied a logarithm of 53, which is 26 and 27 added together, to get all the numbers squashed down, but still of relative value. And so we have kind of achieved what we really hoped to have, actually, without knowing that that's the form it would take. 
So we've got a kind of expressive form of all those timelines set against the geological timeline and it's hand operated. You've just got to go and talk about yourself for half an hour, how hard can it be? And she was right, you know, just talking to people about something you really enjoy, something you're passionate about, it wasn't very difficult. For us, being part of the uh, festival and this particular project, Rock Around the Coast, it means it gives us a great opportunity to promote Portland. It's an island where obviously the urban areas are really close to the wildlife areas and close to the cliffs. And those cliffs themselves have lots of history through quarrying or being part of a defence establishment. So throughout the journey, you're seeing history inter intertwined with wildlife and geology. What do you think you've learnt today? How like the rocks were formed in the shape they are now. Really get close up and really get to understand the boundary between the Upper Jurassic into the Cretaceous period. All we've got to do is get the wind to Weymouth. Why we've got to get the wind to Weymouth is because Weymouth and wind begin with the same letter. Yay! I thank the writers for that. The festival is about getting to people who wouldn't otherwise discover how interesting this all is. What's the lifetime value of a young person who discovers an ammonite? You know, if that relationship is nurtured through all their lives, that is a great way for them to get involved in the sciences and not just the natural sciences but science more generally. So I get him ready for you in the morning, I brush his teeth and I polish his flippers. They told us all about evolution so it could change one of us into something like a reptile or an amphibian. Maybe one day the human race might evolve into something much, much better. Okay, so that was the biggest project. And then we had a few other projects. I'll just run through those really quickly. Um, so we had the next biggest project, which was also um, produced for the 2012 Olympics, was Exploratory Laboratory, which was um, five artists in residence in five situations, non-gallery situations along the coast, um, where they worked with a... I, I guess a sort of natural history organisation in most cases, um, National Trust. I don't know how many of you will know the places in England, National Trust. We had um, a country park um, and three others as well. And they produced work that was then exhibited in non-gallery spaces along the coast. Um, and that's just an example of two of those. Um, we had Coastal Voices, which brought together about a thousand local people to sing songs about the Jurassic Coast, commissioned four composers to make new work. Um, and they were performed both along the Jurassic Coast. We did the Weymouth opening ceremony for the Olympic Games and then went on to London and performed in the River of Music Festival. Um, and those pieces of music are there now, so other people can perform them too. Um, at a slight tangent, um, when I came into the post, there were so many questions that needed to be an answered and so many different agendas and different people wanting different things from the program that I got chatting to people at Exeter University in the geography department. And we agreed that it would warrant a collaborative um, PhD studentship. So we got funding for three PhDs starting in consecutive years in 2010. First one was about carnival, the second one was called Geobiographies of Stone, and the third one is still ongoing, Dynamic Art Practices and the Geographies of World Heritage. Um, this was Universal Valley, which was one of the first projects that we did. Uh, it was three, it was one artist, Charlie Morrissey, who came down and did three different interventions um, along the Jurassic Coast on the beaches um, using projections and dance. He's a choreographer. Um, this was a company called State of Emergency who were working with a um, choreographer called Gregory Makoma from South Africa who'd um, created a piece called the Skeleton Coast, about the Skeleton Coast in Namibia and was really interested to transfer that piece to, to the Jurassic Coast to think about skeletons of the past and skeletons of the present together. We had a a uh, photographer called Ben Osborne who was in residence with two of the local roaring touring, rural touring um, companies, Arts Reach and Villages in Action, who created a, 
slideshow of beautiful images and went around the Jurassic Coast and then all over England and I think he's been into Europe as well to talk about the Jurassic Coast and his experience. Um, we also had a program called Bog Standard or Beautiful which the idea was for us to work with uh, planners and engineers to explore the role that artists can take in developing the built environment so that it was in keeping with being the setting for a World Heritage Site and those are three projects that we did through that. Um, and there's a biennial festival in Dorset called Inside Out Dorset and we worked with them in 2010, so this was two years before the Olympics, um, to develop a piece called The Rock Charmer, which was a, an artist who does live puppetry and then projects it, and he projected it in this case onto the cliffs, working with a Finnish accordion player called Kimo Pohonon. Um, that was three nights running, you had to walk a mile to get to this old quarry site. Um, in the dark, and we walked back in a procession with lanterns, which was really beautiful. We were really lucky with the weather. It was beautiful, starry night every night with the moon out and really atmospheric. So, oh, this has lost its formatting somewhat. This is uh, page 16, I think, in your handouts. Um, and this was intended to pro people who want to work with the arts but don't know how, and that was what I spent the first three years doing was negotiating the space in which artists could work productively with a team of people who aren't used to working with artists and aren't used to taking creative risks in that way. Um, and this is really intended for them, but there are sort of five ways that you can work with artists, I think, on heritage sites, and that, correct me if you think I'm wrong. Um, so we can commission work, which is where the site decides what it wants and then commissions it. Um, you can program work, so see something that's somewhere else that you think resonates with the site and bring it to the site. Uh, we can be opportunistic, so there's a project happening anyway and they want to be associated with the site. Um, you can integrate it, so you can build it into the planning and fundraising activities of the, of the site. Or you can develop partnerships, and my own feeling is that partnerships is by far the strongest way to develop work. Um, that ongoing relationships develop much, much richer work. Um, so the second part of my job, the last two years, was a project that we called Creative Coast 2012, which was about strategically embedding the arts into the work of the World Heritage Site. Um, it had four areas of work. First was events, where we developed a Creative Coast forum, which was expanding on the idea of the steering group and just bringing more voices to the table. Um, we held four events. I'll come on to those in a moment. Um, arts project development, which took up by far the most of my time because there were so many projects going on on such a big scale. Um, strategy, so I was reviewing the art strategy and the management plan, and I was looking at other management plans for other protected sites in the UK. Um, and advocacy, we had a PR campaign and did workshops um, the most influential one, I think, was probably for UNESCO at their, their uh, international meeting, which was last year in Angkor, Angkor Wat, I think. Um, I didn't go, it was my manager went to that one. Um, so the Creative Coast Forum, we had four events. So the first one looked at the introduction to the idea of having a forum to develop and implement the Creative Coast project beyond 2012. So how are we going to carry on this work? There's all this, been all this money invested, um, and how do we keep that going? Second one looked at festivals and tourism. Um, it's there's a huge tourism economy on the Jurassic Coast, and it would have would make a lot of sense for that to be better integrated with the cultural infrastructure. So we had a session about that. Um, the third one was with in partnership with Exeter University and looked at artists and scientists and how we can work together to improve management. And the final one was for the future. Um, I just like this picture. Why I put this one on? This was from the Arts Festivals and Tourism Forum and we asked people to draw the relationships that they had on the map. And you can see that there are, you know, enormous, this is just a few people in a room and there are an enormous amount of relationships that go backwards and forwards along the coast and this sort of web of how that works and who's got relationships with who and how those can bring about amazing projects. Um, so the last section of the presentation is about the arts and the new management plan. Um, so every five years, World Heritage Sites have to write a new contract with UNESCO. Um, and the timing was perfect for mine. So the, the new one started next year. Um, 
So the consultation ran through the Creative Coast 2012 project um, and we were looking to identify key, key areas of work coming up for, for 2019. Um, we got the steering group to acknowledge that some of these could benefit from an arts approach, which was a bigger task than you might imagine. And finally, um, as I said, the Creative Coast Forum brought together landowners, education workers, tourism workers and conservation partners with arts partners to identify what the areas of work might be and to develop plans for how they might go about delivering them. I'm coming back to key observations and recommendations just as a reminder, so clarity of purpose, less can be more, communicate, communicate, communicate and that we did establish that the arts can support the management of a naturally designated site. So that's it for me on the presentation, but I'd really love to have a conversation about some of that. If anybody's got any questions, I think we've got time, haven't we? Yeah, yeah, we're yeah. good. Yes. <laughs> Who would like to ask the first question? Okay, I think you might have to come a little bit closer. Let's see. Oh, no, maybe here. <laughs> Hello. Um, thank you for the presentation. I'm interested in uh, the integrative approach. Um, you were explaining these um, types of approaches um, of working with arts, and um, probably you used now for the second part of, uh, of the strategy, the integrative approach. So maybe you could explain a bit how you um, yeah, worked. How, how we did it. Yes. It, that was really through the, mainly through the Creative Coast Forum and also through the partnerships that we developed over the previous three years and then extended partnerships. So all the partner organizations had all their partner organizations. And um, it was about being clear about what the aims of the management plan were so that people could understand what those aims were um, and respond to them with creative ideas. And it's also about the people who manage the site understanding the arts process and how it raises questions that sometimes aren't answered. And you never know, as I said earlier, you just never know quite what's going to come out of an arts project. And it, it, most of them work out fine but some of them don't, and you have to allow for this risk-taking culture, which is, doesn't come naturally. Um, I forgot to say, but we were the Jurassic Coast Partnerships hosted by the Dorset County Council, so we work within a local authority environment, which is not, a, they're not renowned for being great risk-takers, so um, developing that culture was a lot of what I did. I spent most of my time facilitating conversations between people who didn't really understand each other. Does that answer the question? And then, so that approach was about embedding it in the forward planning for all the organizations concerned. So obviously everybody has a business plan for the next year um, and making sure that it gets written into those business plans and not sort of left by the wayside. So it's sort of trying to bring it up on everybody's priorities on both sides of the, of the discussion. Does that answer? Yeah, <laughs> okay. Another question? Oh, okay. It is very hard. <laughs> Next question. Um, I think. Katarina? No? Is there any closing notes that you have? Um, no, I mean. Oh, you have, okay. We have more. Okay, good. Thanks. Thanks for the presentation. I was just wondering how you navigate. Um, the process of installing the works and how the land will be treated in that process. I think that's where you really benefit from working in partnership because once you understand what each organization's um, trying to achieve, then that conversation naturally opens and you kind of, for instance, for the inside out performance in the quarry, there are lots of rare bats that live in that quarry and we had to work with the, with the Bat Conservation Trust to make sure that what we were doing wasn't going to disturb the bats because they're an endangered species. Um, so it's, it's drawing in the right partnerships for each project and making sure that the approach is always to tread lightly and to leave no trace, basically. Um, 
which is quite difficult when you're bringing generators down a track and yeah, and playing loud music and don't, you know, projecting huge images onto cliffs. But yeah, so that, that's it. It's about the partnerships. <laughs> Echoing what Rosanna said, it's all about the relationships. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks for the information. Um, I have a question to Charlie Morrissey. How important is he to promote such a site in a touristic way and also in a local way? Do you mean in terms of his professional profile? Yes, exactly. That was a really difficult conversation that we had to negotiate. So many of the projects, as you saw from the film, were local projects with local artists. Um, but it was quite important also to get some better known artists involved. And that was one of the things that the Jurassic Coast team were least comfortable with because they didn't feel rightly that they could curate an arts program because clearly they, you know, they really didn't know, they didn't know, didn't have the confidence to judge quality. Um, and I think for 2012 it was quite important to draw in some of the bigger names, although Charlie was one of the first artists who we worked with, so it, that wasn't really for 2012, it just kind of fell like that. Um, but I think a combination, I think one of the things that you can do if you have a large scale programme like this is to bring in talent from outside as well as to give the talent that you have in your locality the opportunities to learn and expand their practice as well. So I think as long as it's on a kind of sharing basis and that they come in not preaching to everybody but kind of willing to work in partnership, then it, it's really important. Yeah. One thing that I've forgotten to say, which is, might be important to people, is about the budget. So when I came into post, there was a £500,000 budget for three years. And what the other thing that we showed was that that budget was a good investment because we ended up spending, drawing in about £5 million worth of funding for the arts into the area, which was a huge amount of money for that. It's a tiny rural communities area with two cities, one at each end. And those kinds of budgets don't normally come into that area. So, I mean, partly because of the Olympics, but also partly because the place was a World Heritage Site, we managed to attract a lot more investment into the area, which has, I think, benefited everybody involved. Yeah. Um, maybe, do you have any, like, uh, for closing, uh, a favorite um, artwork or a story that you want to share in closing? A favorite artwork or story? God, there's so many. Um, not really. I mean, I, I worked, as well as my official role, I worked voluntarily on a lot of the arts projects, and I helped to paint the player or I helped to... I was an air hostess on, on board, and I, I think for me, getting actually physically involved with the pieces of art and developing, creating them, and having that personal relationship with the artists, where they could see what I was doing and I could see what they were doing and how hard they all worked. I mean, my God, they, everybody put in so many hours above what they were being paid for, if they were being paid at all. Um, and for me, I suppose those are the takeaway. Um, memories of it. We took the Pliosaur to Glastonbury last year, so the, a lot of these artworks are going on to do other things. Um, and that, yeah, it's, it's been really excited being, exciting being involved in a group of really amazing creative people. And I think that's, I mean, it's a really general remark, but that was, that was really what excited me, was working with the artists and working with the scientists. And the scientists have so much knowledge and it. You walk through, a so another thing that really excited me was walking through landscapes with people who see them through different eyes. So if you walk through a landscape with a geomorphologist and they've been trained to look at the land in such a different way, you know, they can go, there was a landslip over there 200 years ago and I can tell because of the vegetation and there was an ice flow over here and they're seeing the history of the earth in the land that they're walking on. And I, I found that endlessly fascinating, just amazing to work with so many different people with so many different knowledges and skills. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I think that's, that's all. I think my close, my final closing remark is thanks for bearing with us in the heat. I'm, I'm melting. <laughs> it's roasting in here. <laughs> Thank you very much, Daisy. That was amazing. Um, we'll have a 10-minute break, and then we'll have our um, last lecture of the, of the conference from um, Klaus Seba. So um, yeah, rehydrate, and we'll see you back in 10 minutes. Thanks.